Hey everyone, we're so excited to share this learning experience with FFA, 4-H, and Pony Club members. So thanks for being here. My name is Katie Starr and I'm with the Stanley Premium Western 4-H marketing team. In case you are not familiar with us, Stanley Premium Western 4-H is a family-owned business located in Southern Idaho, which is in the Western United States, with ideal growing conditions to raise some of the best quality forage in the country. We're always striving to make life easier and more convenient on you as equine and livestock owners. Today we're gonna to be covering an introduction to horse digestion and forage. In case you haven't had a chance yet to download the worksheet that goes along with the presentation, you can download it from the handout section in the control panel of this webinar, or if you would rather, you can head on over to our website at stanleyforage.com under nutrition and then nutritional resources. Towards the top under nutritional webinars, you can download the worksheet that goes along with this presentation. If you're following along with the recording, this webinar will later be linked just a little further down under recorded webinars. And if you click on the introduction to horse digestion, the worksheet can be found there. So go ahead and print off the worksheet if you haven't done that quite yet as we work through the intro here. And as a thank you for tuning in, we're actually gonna be drawing a couple of winners for free product coupons at the end of the webinar, so stick around. You'll see we've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface just so you can kind of see what it looks like. If you click on the red box with a white arrow, you can open and close the control panel anytime during the presentation. If you'd rather listen in over the phone instead of your computer speaker system, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. So everyone's favorite part of our webinars is the Q&A time at the end. You can type in your questions to Dr. Cubit in the questions pane of the control panel. Feel free to ask questions anytime throughout the presentation as they come up and we'll go over them at the end. Sometimes it can be a little intimidating raising your hand in class with your peers, but this will probably be the most comfortable environment for you to get in any and all of your questions answered. So please ask away. And that's all I have for now. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to Dr. Tanya Cubitt with Performance Horse Nutrition, who is one of our Stanley Premium Western Forage equine nutritionists. She has a PhD in equine nutrition and reproduction. We're ready when you are, Dr. Cubitt. Thanks, Katie. And thank you all for getting on today. I know you've probably done some kind of online schooling today and you're sick of staring at a computer screen, but, we're not going to talk about schoolwork. We're not going to talk about how you have to wear a mask when you go out or how much you have to wash your hands or stay away from people. We're going to talk about something fun. We are going to talk about the basics of horse digestion. Um, all of you no doubt have a horse. Maybe you compete. Maybe you're lucky enough that your horse lives in your backyard or maybe your horse lives at a boarding stable. It doesn't matter. Everybody that is around horses in any capacity should have a basic idea of how the horse works. In my line of work, I get asked questions all the time about how do I fix certain problems? My horse has this disease, he has that disease, he's fat, he's thin, how do I fix it? What do I feed him to fix it? Well, I think that we always need to start with what is normal for a horse. So I always like to go over the equine evolution. <clears throat> What are horses meant to do? Not what we do with them, but what are they meant to do? We'll touch on that digestive function. We can follow along the worksheet, and then we'll also touch on what else your horse needs to survive. <clears throat> As Katie said, ask questions throughout. Um, you can type them in. It's really easy to ask questions. And follow along on your worksheet. The worksheet will go in order and I'll give you clues as to, oh, this might be question one, this might be question two. <clears throat> so let's start out with what is the horse designed to do? Now I'm gonna give you a hint and say that question one is on this slide, okay? So horses are designed 
to live in herds. You can see in that photograph on the bottom left hand of your screen, that's a group of wild horses. They're out in a herd because they're number one, they're herd animals. They're eating a wide variety of different forages, weeds, forbs, grasses. They're eating with their heads down on the ground, and that is the natural position for horses to eat. They eat anywhere from 12 to 18 hours out of the day. I usually say on average, they eat about 17 hours a day. They're grazing for about 17 hours a day. They move around while they eat. <clears throat> they eat off the ground. So you can think about when we stick them in stalls, well, they don't move, they're not in a herd, and most likely they're eating out of buckets at chest height. So as we go through understanding what horses are designed to do, think about your how you keep your horse and maybe a couple of things that you could do to change that are within the practicality of your facility that might mimic more what is normal for horses. So when they put their head on, on the ground, there are other things that happen. So when he puts his head on the ground, his teeth align, which we'll talk about, but he also increases the natural drainage of the respiratory tract. So there's all this mucusy gunk, snot for lack of a better word, that is in the respiratory tract. <clears throat> and what it does is when he breathes in pollen or dust or mold, <clears throat> that mucus, grabs onto all of those toxins. And when he puts his head down on the ground, that mucus drains out and flushes out all that dust and mold and, and pollen, et cetera. It increases chewing time. We'll look at a, some research that shows when he puts his head on the ground to chew, it takes him a lot longer to chew. We've all seen, you know, I, I grew up in Pony Club and we were always told that we should hang our hay bags in the back of the stall and up high because number one, we don't want his foot to get stuck in the hay bag. But what I find in practice is when we do that, if we stick the hay bag too high, especially now that we're using those slow feed hay nets with the smaller diameter, some horses can get real, a lot of tension in their neck and back because they're constantly yanking at that hay net trying to get that hay out of it. So utilizing slow feed options that keep the hay closer to the ground while still being safe so that he can't get his foot stuck in it um, are more ideal than hanging things high on the wall. You can see on the right hand side that white horse in that box stall looks like a beautiful stall, nice and clean. It's probably even got a heat lamp in there. He's got a fan. That is how we keep most of our horses today. At some, for some period of the day, they're stuck in a stall. Maybe they get access to turnout, pasture, but most of our horses come in for some length of time. We feed them a lot more cereal grain-based diets because we're riding them more, we're expecting them to live till they're 30 and have five different careers. Um, we do exercise at speed, whether it be barrel racing or sporting games or eventing. Um, so they need more calories to maintain weight and maintain their exercise. But they can consume this feed pretty quickly. And if they consume it really quickly, we'll look at the parts of the digestive system and how it can increase the acidity. Now, when I talk about acidity, think about lemon juice. Lemon juice is an acid. And if you get a paper cut on your finger and you stick your finger in that lemon juice, it hurts. That will hurt, happen in the horse's gut as well. <clears throat> Some horses really don't like to be stuck in a stall by themselves. We've all had that horse that whinnies when his pasture mates or his stable mates get taken away. Uh, others really don't care if they don't have anybody's with them. All they want to do is stand around and eat. And then we have varying levels of exercise. But the big thing about managing our horses in stalls is the position that we hang the feed bucket. And I ideally would like it if we could all have our feed buckets on the ground, because again, it's going to increase chewing time, it's going to be better for teeth alignment, and it's going to improve drainage of the respiratory tract. So if we think about the digestive system, let's, where does it start? The digestive system starts with the teeth, and that's why it's really important that you get your horse's teeth floated regularly, because if they can't chew the food and it just all keeps falling out and going on the ground, there's really no point continuing. 
the presentation because the rest of the digestive system would be shut off. So we need to make sure that the food is being absorbed and it's getting into the digestive system. So a horse out of pasture, those wild horses out in a field constantly grazing for 17 hours out of the day, they're gonna chew about 60,000 times a day. So let's take our thousand pound horse and we'll put him in a stall and we'll feed him one and a half percent of his body weight in hay, which is about 15 pounds of hay. He's gonna chew that about 25,000 times. And then we give him say six pounds of grain, maybe 12 pounds of grain. Well, total all that up, hay and grain, he would only chew at most about 30,000 times. So you can see when they don't have constant access to something to chew on, whether it be hay or pasture, we significantly cut down the amount of chews that a horse does. What else happens when you chew? Most of you have probably had your dinner all, already. When you chew food, what happens? You produce saliva in your mouth. And saliva helps to lubricate the throat so that you don't choke, but it also in horses buffers that stomach acid. It buffers that acidity so that it doesn't sting the gut lining and cause issues. So when we talk about what comes after the teeth. We talk about the esophagus. It's the tube that takes the food from the mouth down to the stomach. Um, now, here we get worried about horses choking. And some folks will tell you that, well, I would never feed beet pulp or I'd never feed pellets or I'd never feed this or that because my horse will choke on it. But I'm here to tell you that horses don't choke on a particular ingredient, they choke as a function of their behavior. Horses that are hungry, just like people, eat fast. When I'm starving, I eat fast, and oftentimes I need to have a big drink of water because the food is really, I've got too much in my mouth and it's hard to swallow. And horses are the same way. So what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that number one, we're putting the feed close to the ground, because that's gonna increase chewing. It actually takes more saliva to chew hay than it does grain. So if you feed a little hay first, that's gonna get that saliva going. Also slow them down. They'll think, oh gosh, I've, you know, I've been eating something. They're gonna slow down their intake and then you can give them their grain and that will decrease their risk for choking. But number one, we wanna make sure that uh, we just slow them down. That will decrease their risk for choke. So I mentioned saliva um, being a buffer to that stomach acid and the more the horse chews, the more saliva that will be produced. So let's take two pounds of grain and put it in a tub on the ground. The horse will chew that a thousand times. We can put these little um, uh, monitors on the horse's halter and it actually measures the amount of times the horse chews. And so we've done that and we know that if we put that grain on the ground in a bucket, he'll chew it about a thousand times. If we take two pounds of hay and put it on the ground, he'll chew that about 2,000 times. But if we take two pounds of oats or grain and put it at chest height, he's gonna only chew that between 350 and 500 times. So you can see we've significantly cut back on the amount of saliva that's being produced. So we could increase our risk for choke, but we can also, we're also decreasing that saliva. Now saliva has, um, is much less acidic, so we when it's more like water. So when we put that into the stomach, it dilutes that acid, so it's not as strong and not as painful to the horse. So from the esophagus, we go to the stomach. And the stomach I've got highlighted here in pink, and the big long squiggly thing is the small intestine, and then the big cloud-like fluffy thing at the end, that's the hind gut of the horse, and we'll get to that at the end. But you can see that the stomach is very small in the horse. Unlike if I showed you a picture of a lion or a tiger, they have a really large stomach because they're gonna hunt their food and then they're gonna eat it, gorge on it and eat it. But remember, the horse is meant to be grazing continually. So he has a small stomach because he doesn't need to eat large meals. In fact, meal feeding is one of the more foreign things we can do with horses. He's meant to have a small amount of food constantly trickling through the digestive system. We actually call them trickle feeders for that reason. 
I don't like to feed any more than three to four, maybe at a stretch, five pounds of grain in a single meal. Now, when we're feeding more high fiber type products that are beet pulp based, we can get away with that higher intake rate. But let's just say you're feeding a sweet feed because you need the carbohydrates for your horse to go fast or palatability. We don't want to feed any more than say three to four pounds in a single meal because it's just going to overload that stomach. If I cut a window in the stomach and let you look inside, that's an actual photograph there on the right hand side. There are two distinct regions to the stomach. There's this top part, which fancy name is squamous mucosa, but the easy name is the non-protected region. Okay, the bottom section, that dark pink tissue, hard name, glandular mucosa, scientific name, easy name, protected region. So what's it protected by? There's this mucousy coating slimy gooey coating that protects that tissue from the acid because there's little cells down there that secrete acid because acid continues to break down the food you know if you put acid if you put grass in with acid it'll slowly break it down and that's what the stomach is for it's to break down that food but we don't want that acid to build up and build up and build up. And what happens, it'll splash. When you go out for a ride, it'll splash up onto that non-protected light pink region and cause ulcers. So we want to make sure that we're feeding them close to the ground. We're feeding plenty of hay and we're not feeding too much feed in a single meal. Gastric ulcers are very common in our performance horses. Uh, 90% of horses have gastric ulcers. About 60% have them in the hindgut, which we haven't talked about yet. And when I say gastric ulcers, I mean in the stomach. And about half the population have them in both regions. And what might you notice in your horse or pony if they have ulcers? They might be a little girthy. They might not like it when you brush over their hindquarter. They might not want to go forward when you squeeze them with the leg. They might not want to eat their food. Just not feeling great, poor hair coat, losing weight. These are all symptoms of ulcers. What causes them? Meal feeding, because then we have these big times during the day where they're not eating anything. And remember, they're meant to be continually grazing and continually producing that saliva, not feeding enough hay, transporting them to shows, putting them in strange stables, doing all kinds of exercise. But I know we're not going to change the transport and the stabling and the exercise. These are things we will get back to. Don't, don't fret about that. We will get back to doing those. Um, and they do cause stress to horses. So how do we decrease that stress? One of the easiest ways is to make sure that we're feeding plenty of fiber or hay to our horses. Um, alfalfa is a natural solution for stomach ulcers. Alfalfa is high in calcium. Now, if you put calcium into acid, it neutralizes it, it weakens it. So if you took calcium like a Tums and you put it into lemon juice and then you stuck your finger in it that had the paper cut on it, it wouldn't hurt your finger anymore because that acid has been neutralized. We also want to feed frequent meals. So we typically ask for some group participation when we do our webinars. But tonight, what we thought would be a cool thing for everybody to see is where are you all from? So if you want to write in the chat box where you're located, I think it would be really cool for the other particip participants to see where everybody's from, to feel a little bit of a sense of a community that we're all in this together. We're all learning about nutrition together. Um, it's really, it seems like a really big world right now and we're so distant from each other, but actually we're very close. So if you want to write in the chat box where you're from, that would be great. Dr. Cubitt, we're getting a lot from all over. We have some coming in from Kansas. We have Georgia, Washington, Delaware, Texas, Indiana, South Carolina, Alaska. 
How cool is that? Ohio, Connecticut. Awesome. We're getting a lot of great coverage uh, all over the place. We got some in Tennessee and Wyoming. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. So uh, go ahead, Dr. Cubit. You can keep keep moving on. Thank you. So I got a little bit of a fright because I went to the next slide, which is the small intestine, and our horse has lost his small intestine. I'm not quite sure where his small intestine has gone. But you can look at your diagram, and we've talked about the stomach, and the next part of the digestive system is the small intestine. And if you remember from my picture here, it's this big, long, squiggly thing. It's like a garden hose. It's about that diameter. It's about 70 feet in length. Now that should give you a bit of a clue on your horse digestive system as to which, which label we're, we're marking right now. So there is an, we've got acid in the stomach and then we move to the small intestine where there's enzymes that continue to break down the food, okay? And there is a particular enzyme called amylase. And amylase is responsible for breaking down sugars and starches. So here's another reason why we don't wanna feed large meals to horses. Because if we feed too much grain in a single meal, that amylase gets used up and then this undigested grain flows into the hindgut of the horse and causes all kinds of problems with the bacteria that live back there. So when we feed grains like corn and oats and barley to our horses because we want that for weight gain or we want it for speed and exercise, we need to make sure that we're feeding processed grains. Oats are safe to feed unprocessed but corn and barley and other grains need to be processed in order to be safely digested. So we talked about where we're from. Now we're into the hind gut of the horse. We've talked about from the mouth of the horse to the small intestine, that's what we call the foregut of the horse. Okay, now we're into the hind gut of the horse. Hind gut starts with the cecum. The cecum is a blind sac. I've got it highlighted here in yellow. It's like a balloon. So when I say it's like a balloon, the entry and exit to the cecum is in the same place. So it's really easy for gas to build up here and cause gas colic pain in the gut. It's about four feet in length. Um, and this is where we start bacterial fermentation. So the hindgut is full of bacteria. The stomach has acid, the small intestine has enzymes like amylase, and the hindgut has bacteria, trillions of different kinds of bacteria. We go from the cecum to the large colon, and the large colon it twists and it turns. And again, it's really easy for gas to build up here if we get those ba bacteria a little out of balance. What would cause them to be a little out of balance? Well, if they ate some spring grass that they weren't used to, or they got into the feed room, or um, temperature changes can cause that, changes in hay, changes in feed, stress, all of these things can change the bacterial population in the hindgut. Now, how would you know that the bacteria in the horse's hindgut had changed. Classic sign, first sign, easiest sign is diarrhea. Loose manure or diarrhea is a sign that the bacteria in the horse's hindgut are a little out of balance. The other thing that occurs here in the hindgut with all these bacteria is when the bacteria are fermenting or breaking down this fiber, a byproduct that they create is heat. So in the winter time, the simplest thing to feed your horse to keep them warm is plenty of hay. Hay is full of fiber and as those bacteria break that fiber down, 
they create heat. So that is the simplest thing to keep your horse warm in the wintertime. Now, if you live in Texas and you want to ride your pony or horse in the middle of summer, you need to make sure that you're feeding very digestible sources of fiber. So you don't want to be feeding a really stalky, stemmy first cut hay in the middle of summer in Texas, because again, that's going to create heat that your horse may not be able to dissipate. So um, in the wintertime, we want to feed a lot of hay that, and it can be a little stemmy so that we create a lot of heat. The hindgut is also where we see these colonic ulcers, these hindgut ulcers. Now that tissue looks terrible. It looks very inflamed. Just imagine falling over and grazing your knee. Now you just take that top surface of skin off, but then you get in the shower at night to take a shower and by golly, does it sting, sting, sting. Same thing occurs in the hindgut of the horse. The top layer of skin is ulcerated. It's been taken off. Now there's all kinds of bacteria live there so that we can get a fever now. There is um, intermittent colic-like symptoms because it's very painful. And again, a lot of diarrhea with horses that have hindgut ulcers. What do you do for these horses? Well, that long stem hay can be a little abrasive. It can be a little painful. So pelleted or cubed forage for about four weeks can be a way to clear up diarrhea that might be caused by hindgut ulcers. Then we go to the small colon and the small colon is really where we're going to suck moisture out of that non-digested fiber that's left over and form fecal balls. And fecal balls, that's what we spend most of our time with horses picking up out of the out of their stalls. And then really the last little tail of this digestive system is the rectum. So that should fill out your horse's digestive system diagram. And now we're, we should be going to page three of your worksheet. So what does, what does the horse need to keep all of this gut functioning and working properly? Well, an absolute bare minimum amount of fiber, forage, hay or pasture that your horse needs to eat in one day to keep the gut moving would be 1% of their body weight. So here's a little bit of online math for you. If your horse is 1,000 pounds, which is the average size of uh, most of our 15 hand quarter horse thoroughbreds, be about 1,000 pounds. 1% 1 of 1,000 pounds is 10 pounds of forage. He will lose weight and he'll probably get cranky if you only feed him that much. So we don't ever feed that little. If I have a really fat horse and I want him to lose some weight, I'll feed him about 1.2% of his body weight. So that'd be about 12 pounds a day. But remember, I'm gonna try and spread that out through the day to mimic grazing behavior. But typically I want you to feed between one and a half to two and a half percent of your horse's body weight. So for that 1,000 pound horse, that's 15 to 25 pounds of hay per day. And I want you to split that up over the whole day. Split it up and try to mimic that grazing behavior as best that you possibly can. What else does your horse need to absolutely need to survive? Water, it's absolutely critical. <clears throat> In cooler weather, they're going to drink about 10 to 12 gallons of water a day. So think about your gallon milk jug in the refrigerator, line 10 to 12 of those up, fill them with water, and that's how much water he should be consuming in one day when it's cold weather and they're not exercising a lot. In hotter weather, they're going to consume anywhere from 20 to 25 gallons and sometimes more depending on the humidity level and the exercise level. So that's a lot of water you need to make sure that horses have access to clean, fresh water that's neither cold nor hot, and that will um, keep your horse healthy. 
So to wrap it all up, the teeth are the first part of the digestive system, followed by the stomach, which is very small, and it contains acid, which is there to break down food, but if it gets too strong, it can cause gastric ulcers. Then we go to the small intestine that uses enzymes to break down food. It's about 70 feet in length, so it's kind of long, looks like a garden hose. And then we go to the hindgut, which is made up of the cecum, the large colon, the small colon, and the rectum. And it's full of bacteria, and those bacteria are fiber digesters. And this is why we don't make rapid feeding changes, because those bacteria don't like to be their food source to be changed. And water is absolutely essential. So that is your whirlwind tour of the digestive system. And now I would open the floor to any questions that you have. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Cubitt. And really quick, as you guys are typing in your questions, we just want to remind you that we're going to be drawing for two, two winners for free product coupons following this Q&A time. Um, so get your questions in and we'll uh, draw those winners soon. Let's go ahead and start with some of the questions that have come in so far. We have, Jody wants to know, Dr. Cubitt, what protocol is best for insulin resistance and or laminitic horses? Fantastic question. And now I'm, I'm gonna preface this and say, it doesn't matter whether your horse is fat, thin, suffers from tying up, has metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, they all still need to eat at least 1.2% of their body weight per day. So with a horse that has metabolic issues, laminitis, Cushing's, insulin resistance, we want to make sure that we're keeping the carbohydrates, those sugars and starches low in the diet. If it's a fat horse, we want to make sure we're feeding a hay that's low in calories. So getting a hay test or using hay sources like our, um, our more native warm season grasses like teff is a variety of hay that does not accumulate a lot of sugars and starches and it's also relatively low in calories calories put weight on um, so number one we need to keep the sugars and starches less than 10 percent and depending on whether the horse is fat or thin as to whether we need calories or not if we've got a fat horse we want to use something like teff with very little calories. And if we've got a thin horse that we want to put weight on, something like alfalfa. Perfect. Thank you. So Connie wrote in and Connie said, I am hoping to haul two states away this summer. How do I adapt my horse for the change in hay? Can I fee feed entirely a cubed or pelleted product? How do I adapt them to a fully processed complete feed? Now that's a great question and it all, so I can't really get some clarification. So I'll make a few assumptions that, you know, we have clients that will go back country riding, for example, and they cannot pack in hay, long stem hay. Um, and they need certified weed free forages that are easy to pack. So we get them adjusted to cubed pelleted forage before they go, and then that's what they feed throughout their riding experience. Now, the thing with pelleted and cubed forage is if it's 100% of the horse's fiber requirement is coming from pelleted or cubed forage, they eat it really quickly. So that mimicking grazing behavior becomes a little bit more difficult. If you're simply just moving your horse, going from one place to another, and you want to minimize the dietary change of hay, but you can't, um, you know, get any of the hay that they will be on where you're going, then yes, I would adapt them to some, uh, use your, your hay that you have locally and adapt them to some pelleted or huge forage that you can then take with you and as you add in some of the new hay, you've still got your pelleted and cubed forage, which is forming your basis, which is not changing, if that makes sense. Okay. And did you mention like a time frame if they're transitioning that over like a few days ahead of time or what, what is your recommendation? 
So those bacteria that live in the hindgut of the horse take a full 21 days to adapt to new types of food. Now, if we're just changing the fiber source, then it's about 14 days. So anywhere from seven to 14 days is a safe window to adjust them to new types of, whether it be hay or grain. Okay, perfect. Rachel wants to know, can you explain colic? How do you treat it? Mm, now that's a great question. Just like laminitis, there are a thousand and one different colics in horses, but I am actually just gonna go back so that we can look on our slide here and I'll show you in the digestive system where colic primarily is going to occur. It's primarily gonna occur here in the large colon because of bacterial upset. Um, the two most common colics are impaction colic and gas colic. Now gas colic is where those bacteria get out of balance and they create a little extra gas. You know yourself when you eat something that wasn't quite right, your stomach doesn't feel great, might get a little gassy. Um, and what happens is because the intestine isn't really attached very well to the um, kind of wall of the horse's abdominal cavity, that gas, just like when you fill up a balloon with helium, can move the colon around. And when it moves the colon around, it can twist on itself. Um, and that can be very painful. And it can actually, if it twists on itself, cut off blood circulation. So then we go from a gas colic, which is really just gas pockets causing pain, to more of a stricture colic where we're actually cutting off blood supply. Impaction colic we see a lot when the seasons change. And really it's just a dehydration of the digestive system. I see it most frequently in the fall when we're going from horses eating pasture that's got moisture in it and it's warmer and they're exercising more and they're drinking more to the cooler weather and we've frosted the, the grass and so they're eating primarily hay, which is very dry and they're exercising a little less, it's not as warm out so they're drinking less and it just takes a little while for the digestive system to adjust to a shift in hydration status um so that's where we see impaction colic occur the most when foods dry and it just gets stuck because they don't have enough moisture in the gut there are a lot of other different types of colic but they're the two most common Perfect. Thank you. I know there's a lot that goes that you can you could you could do a whole webinar on colic. <laughs> Absolutely. So Mackenzie would like to know what supplements do you find are helpful for keeping a healthy GI tract? You know, that's a great question as well. And it really drives home the point that we, we've heard the saying, no hoof, no horse, but my philosophy is no gut, no horse, because the gut is the driving force. It is the engine to the whole horse. And without a healthy gastrointestinal system, we really are going to see um, diminished hair quality and hoof quality and poor weight gain and poor performance. So keeping the horse's gut healthy is really important. Keeping the horse's gut healthy primarily is by keeping all the bugs that live in the hindgut, keeping them healthy. So number one, before we even get into supplements, feeding quality hay and feeding it consistently. Horses are routine animals. They want to make sure the hay is there continually. Good quality, clean, consistent hay. And then we look at digestive aids like live cell yeast culture, for example, which is a tiny, tiny, tiny plant. But what it does is it can help stabilize the acidity in the hindgut. Um, it can help feed those good bacteria and keep them proliferating. And as far as the stomach, we want to add things like alfalfa, which is gonna add calcium to help buffer that stomach acid and keep the stomach healthy. Okay, perfect, thank you. Luke would like to know, what is the best nutrition plan to maintain a healthy weight for a senior performance horse that is still active? Sorry, Katie, can you repeat that? Uh, 
what is the best nutrition plan to maintain a healthy weight for a senior performance horse that is still active? Perfect, perfect. And it comes back that the foundation to any horse's diet, be it young or old, is the forage. And I am a proponent of always trying to add better quality, more calorie dense forage if I'm trying to gain weight on a horse before adding a lot of grain. And it doesn't matter whether I'm speaking on behalf of a grain company or on a forage company, forage is the most important part of any horse's diet. So you want to make sure with a senior horse, if they have any dental issues, that you're feeding a hay or a forage product that potentially is shorter stem length, that maybe a chop if their teeth are okay, but not great. And if their teeth are really suffering, then you're going to want to feed a pelleted or cube product that can be soaked. Um, but typically what we struggle with with older horses is body weight maintenance, that they lose a little top line, they're losing body weight, they're not maintaining themselves as well. So adding alfalfa to the diet because it's really high in good quality protein and calories is my foundation. Adding then a high fat, high fiber feed. If you feed a senior feed, you need to make sure that you're feeding it according to the feeding directions. Um, and then adding other calories from fat are also ideal for older horses. Excellent. Okay, let's see. Heather would like to know, are there any specific causes for the bacteria, the bacteria in the hindgut, specifically the cecum, to suddenly die? Huh. <laughs> I'm laughing because anything can cause these. These bacteria are so fickle. Um, and it can be, it literally can be change in feed. It can be a weather change. It can be uh, any kind of stress to the horse, whether that be transporting them, stabling them, taking their pasture made away. Um, I don't know, a goat ran across the field in some cases. So stress, stress also comes, psychological stress in horses is a real thing. So like I say, taking away their, their buddies is a psychological stress. Also, horses are very routine animals. And so if you, let's say you feed your horses at seven in the morning and five in the afternoon, and for some reason you didn't come until 6.30 in the afternoon, that would really stress them out. And that could be enough to really damage that hindgut population. So as far as, is there anything that can kill off the hindgut bacteria? Anything and everything can affect them. Toxicity also, let's say you had a retained placenta in a brood mare, or they ate a toxic weed, or they had some kind of poison in them. These can all kill off the bacteria as well. Okay. Uh, Jenna wanted to let you know, I've struggled to keep a good top line on my 16 year old quarter horse. She's on 24 seven hay, five pounds grain, one pound alfalfa and a supplement for ulcers a day, at least one day a week of exercise. What would you recommend that could help her gain a better top line? If she's not it depends on the hay that you're feeding. So I'm going to assume she's probably getting plenty of protein in her diet because a lot of times we, we talk about protein when we talk about top line and muscle development. But what I didn't hear was any pasture in her diet, which is not uncommon that horses don't get access to pasture. And so you might try a vitamin E supplement, a natural vitamin E uh, to help with the top line. Perfect. Okay. Uh, Carol would like to know, I know we need to worm our horses, but how does this hurt the good bacteria, bacteria in the hindgut? How can we help our horses tolerate worming better? The actual deworming doesn't necessarily affect the microbes that live in the hindgut of the horse, um, the actual paste, the chemical that you use. But what can disrupt the hindgut bacteria is some horses really stress when you do it. Um, they don't like having something stuck in their mouth and being forced to eat something different. So if you have a horse that does tend to stress more around deworming or vaccinations or vet visits or even the farrier coming or dental work, then 
making sure that number one, they, they ate some hay before you give it to them. And also um, a digestive supplement that's got a live cell yeast base may be beneficial. Okay, good. Um, Rachel would like to know, what about horses that chew too much? For example, my horses chew the wood off of any sort of structure mm -hmm. out in the pasture from hay feeders to the weather shelter. Is this bad for their teeth? Typically horses chew, number one, because they're craving non-digestible fiber, or number two, you know, when you chew, you produce saliva and that helps both for the stomach acid. So we'll find horses chew for a number for one of those reasons. They're either craving non-digestible fiber, so feed them some more hay. If you're feeding plenty of hay, maybe throw in some stemmier hay for something to chew on. Um, and then if, you, if you're not feeding enough hay, if you feel like that there are longer than two hours at a time where they don't have something to chew on, um, feed them more hay. I see this a lot in the northeast part of the United States where it's cold and there's a lot of snow on the ground. We come around the end of March and all the horses start to chew wood because they're craving non-digestible fiber. Okay, good. Um, and let's see, Carol says, around us, people are selling tough hay. Is it good? It often looks yellow, but seems very soft and easy to eat. Teff hay is very soft and very palatable. Um, if grown at, by a good, reputable producer, just like any hay, Teff hay is uh, low in cal calories and moderate in protein and low in sugars and starches. So depending on the horse that you're feeding, it can be an excellent forage choice. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. And then Ava wants to know, what about soaking your grain? Is that bad or good? Soaking your grain, soaking your feed and your hay, well, hay, soaking your, your grain is never a bad idea as long as you're not soaking it all day and it's not going, it's not fermenting and going rancid. Um, it gets a little bit more moisture into the horse's gut. So I don't ever think it's a bad idea. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and do, we're going to do one more question. Um, I know there's some in here that we're not going to get to, but um, we're wrapping up on our time and we want to make sure that we get you guys out. Some of you are, it's getting a little bit late for you on the, the East Coast. So um, the last question is, um, is from Hannah. And my horse has always been fussy when I cinch her up. Is it due to ulcer or something else? Nine times out of 10, that is one of the symptoms of gastric ulcers. When you ride her, if she's a little bit, you know, doesn't want to go up, move off your leg, if she doesn't maintain her body weight well, if she's, you know, a bit grouchy when you go in a circle versus going in a straight line, um, these are, th that would indicate to me gastric ulcers. I also just want to shout out fantastic questions, great participation tonight and we need to open our webinars up to to the youth of the equine community a lot more katie because this has been yeah. a great group yeah no we've gotten a great attendance and great engagement um yeah it's been fantastic um and i want to throw in there i did see a question in there that someone had asked i think regarding the questions and i just happened to see it really quick so if you're curious about the front part of the digestive system is the foregut and then the back half is the hindgut so if you guys are still working through some of those questions you can that'll help you complete that um that worksheet out so if you guys have any other follow-up questions on anything like that you know just reach out to us um dr cupid if you wouldn't mind heading to the last slide yes ma'am I want to thank you, um, Dr. Cubit, for putting this on for the 4-H and uh, Pony Club and FFA members that jumped on with us tonight. Uh, we really appreci appreciate all of you guys for attending and being here, and we really hope you enjoyed this experience. We are going to draw our two winners of uh, free product coupons right now. So the winners that we have are Lexi Welsh and Luke Huff. 
thank you guys for being on. We are going to reach out to you, get in contact with you to get your mailing information so we can send those coupons to you guys. And again, uh, if you guys have questions that we weren't able to answer or you're just really curious about, we're, we're here for you. Uh, you know, Dr. Cubit is really great about working with uh, individuals on getting the, this information answered. And we have a great customer service team that works with us as well. So please reach out to us. We have our phone number and our email here on this final slide. And you can also find a lot of great other uh, large and small animal nutritional content on our website at stanleyforage.com. So if you guys have questions on certain things, we hit on a lot of topics uh, that you can check out on our website to learn more. And then um, if you guys like coupons, if you head on over to our website at stanleyforage.com, under the coupon section on the left-hand side of your computer screen, you'll find an offer for $2 off a Stanley Forage product, and that expires May 31st of 2020. So print that off and head on over to your favorite farm and ranch retail store and uh, get some product that will be useful for you. And lastly, when you guys leave the webinar today, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we appreciate you giving us your honest feedback we have, if we have the opportunity to offer some future educational content for 4-H, FFA, and Pony Club groups, this will really help us create better content for you and give you what you need in, in your learning environment. You will also receive a follow-up email within about 24 to 48 hours that will provide you a link of today's recording. And that way you can go back and reference it. Uh, and if you wanna go through the worksheet and finish that up or anything, you'll be able to complete that with the recording as well. And then later, uh, we'll actually place it on our website under nutritional resources, and that way you can reference that at any time in the future. So thank you for tuning in, and be sure to reach out to us if you guys have any follow-up questions at all, and have a great rest of your week.